Um, I did see one comment and I wanted to address it real quick. Uh, we seem to have some um, interstate uh, folks uh, who have joined us. Uh, somebody asked what state we were in. Um, a lot of this information will be fairly focused on Washington. Some of it will be broadly applicable, um, but if you are in a different state uh, than the uh, wet and wild Pacific Northwest, um, do take all this with a grain of salt and reach out to some of your local mm -hmm. institutions um, to get some specific answers as well. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so David and I today are, it's, this is actually kind of a simple talk in a way, but there's a lot of information. So what we're going to do is try to get you started planning a healthy yard and landscape projects that you can enjoy for years to come. So we are going to go over a lot of considerations you may have and whether you're from Washington State or not, some of them will be pretty consistent. And then uh, start talking about how do you get started on your project. Next, um, and you can, oops. Oh, we went ahead. Hang on. Yeah, you can click all the things on that. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I always tell people I am a poster child for anybody can garden. I grew up in Chicago and then moved to northern Minnesota, which is cold and has very short summer. Um, I am not like David working in an environmental field. I was a research scientist first and now I do public involvement for our very large regional sewer system for both capital projects um, and then for emergency response. Okay, so I don't look like I really have a lot of gardening panache. Next. Um, but I purchased a property in 2000. So I will tell you, my mother always gardened whether we were in an apartment or not. I purchased this property in Snohomish County. So I've worked with the absolutely wonderful Snohomish Conservation District for years and years and years. Um, I had horses when I purchased this, I don't now, but my part of my goal was to grow food and harvest some hay, but be um, a good environmental steward. And that's why I started working with the Snohomish Conservation District. Um, I became a certified native plant steward uh, through Snohomish County and the Washington Native Plant Society. And as part of that, you give volunteer hours back. And so I started doing volunteer presentations because I like public speaking. I know not everybody does, but I do. And so I've been doing this for absolutely years and years. And my passion, as you'll see, is landscaping for wildlife. And next. Uh, this year I was like super pleased with myself. So I'm going to do a total humble brag, right? This is the message on this is if I can do it, you can do it. But we did a backyard bird challenge when the pandemic started as a way to kind of connect people once we were on remote work. And so I started going out and taking pictures of the birds I had and then did an, a multimedia piece online for my year in birding plus things. There was a racial justice issue in birding and there's an accessibility, bird, bird accessibility story map that came out. So it was a great year to talk about your backyard birds and your habitat. What I found is I had a huge number of species I didn't even know existed on my property. And they're there because of the work that I've done and the work that the conservation district has helped me with. So again, if I can do this and be this successful, you can. And by the way, I won the most species reported and I got a gift card. So I'm gonna turn it over to David to talk about our great conservation district folks and himself. Well, I, yeah, I'll, I don't enjoy talking about myself but I'm more than happy to talk about the conservation district. Uh, so the conservation district and this, extends to uh, King Conservation District in some ways as well, um, is really about natural resources, uh, agriculture, and in some kind of urban or suburban uh, uh, act, uh, activities. In, in Snohomish, we call it the Community Conservation. Community Conservation is my team. Uh, we focus on technical assistance, uh, which includes stormwater, edible gardens, and backyard habitat. Um, you should definitely feel encouraged to come and check out our website uh, and uh, look through all of the resources we have. You can tell that this slide is a little bit outdated because it has site visits down at the bottom. Um, please do contact us if you need help. Uh, site visits are a little bit more touch and go at the moment for obvious reasons. Uh, so the, the, the part that I dread where I talk about myself, these are obviously old photos because look how close we're all standing without masks on. 
Um, I started my career as a business administrator. Um, I went to University of Washington Bothell. I uh, was in a water monitoring class, uh, was waist deep in uh, mud and silt in the middle of February, um, couldn't feel my feet anymore and realized in that moment that I did not want to work in business anymore. Uh, so I changed my major. Uh, I stomped up with muddy boots to the registrar, changed my major, became an environmental scientist um, shortly after started working at the Snohomish Conservation District and I have never once looked back. Um, a brief overview of the Snohomish Conservation District. Um, we, like I said, work on uh, agriculture, habitat, community conservation. The community conservation is my team. Um, and the four kind of major areas we work on are green stormwater infrastructure, urban agriculture, residential habitats, and fire safe communities. Uh, today, we're not gonna be talking about any of those specifically, but we are going to be talking about um, the way that we can help you and provide resources uh, to do some cool things in your backyard. Here's a brief example of the kind of stuff that we do. Um, these are some larger commercial projects, some rain catchments, some urban, um, some rain gardens in very highly urbanized areas. In the top right is actually a rain, a terraced rain garden that we did at a school um, that's before it got planted. You can see all the stakes still up there. Um, and then in the bottom right uh, with me mercifully a mask over my face um, and our wonderful uh, outreach coordinator, Kari, uh, we are doing a socially distanced rain barrel pickup that we did in Yost Park last year. Um, even in the pandemic, we're doing a lot of different stuff, uh, trying to provide resources and assistance to the communities um, and strongly encourage that uh, folks reach out to us with any sort of questions. Uh, we are here to help. So for our visitor from Kentucky, uh, just for history, the conservation district started as the Soil Conservation Service across the nation after the Dust Bowl years when we lost so much topsoil. So I am thinking Kentucky has a similar type of service still. Obviously the conservation district has evolved with our population and their missions evolved, um, but these were uh, started across the United States to try to conserve soil after we blew most of it away during the Great Depression. Um, Kentucky, uh, so, oh, oh go ahead. Uh, Kentucky actually has soil and water conservation districts, which are very similar to our conservation districts. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that yours are broken up by county. Um, they may be multi-county entities, though, depending on which county you're in. But if you type in your county um, and soil and water conservation district, um, I guarantee you, you'll, you'll be able to, to, um, to, to find some resources and some folks to talk to. Great. So what we're going to do now is launch into getting kind of a big picture. So people tend to look at it and go, oh, I have a new house and I've got a yard or I just want to revamp the yard. And they dive in by starting to buy plants. And what we're going to talk about is backing out and kind of getting a big picture before you start doing things in your yard. It's really tempting, um, but um, I highly recommend having a plan to start out with. Next. Uh, so what we'll walk through is really kind of the fun part, I think, first, is really sitting down with a cup of coffee and thinking about what you want your space to look like, whether it's an apartment with a balcony or a yard or an acreage you know, over time. And then David's going to talk about kind of start us into mapping out what we need to consider as we're planning for this space. We'll talk about how to plan getting your project go going and then getting started on the right foot. Next. So one of the things you want to think about is what's going to happen to the space in the future, right? So are you a young couple and you want to have kids? Are you going to get a dog or a cat and you're going to need space for that? Um, what do you want to see happen to your house over time? Do you expect to have parents or other relatives come and live with you or children come back home as my sister just had experience with? Um, but it's really to sit down and look at the long-term vision because if you think you're going to be putting an addition on your house and stuff like that, you're going to want to think about landscaping in a way that it's easy to take on your next project. Um, and you're going to want your landscape not to have to get torn out because you've changed your mind. It can happen. I was very experimental on mine, but it's costly and it's kind of painful to go through. So sitting down and just thinking, what's my vision for the future is a great first step. Next. 
So I am, my whole focus right now is on wildlife um, on my property and I don't have horses anymore, but this is a great property for upland wildlife. I'm in the Pacific Flyway. So we have birds coming from the, uh, actually the Arctic and South America um, that pass us and we have resident birds and insects. So this is what my focus is. That may not be yours. You may have another focus next. Color is something, so I don't know what Kentucky looks like this time of year, but the Pacific Northwest is pretty dark green, gray, heavy clouds. And so color is really welcome. Uh, in about, I would say a month, we'll start to have color in our yards, right? Our first plants will start to come up with their flowers. Uh, hellebores will come out and we'll have Indian plum and catkins and stuff. But color is really important to a lot of people in their yard, seasonal color. Next. Fragrance is something that's important to a lot of people. Uh, it's one of those senses that you tend to remember, like most people now don't remember the smell of cut hay, but people will remember a place more by scent than even by a visual picture in their head. So fragrance can be very important to you. Next. Food, hopefully people here are thinking about growing food. This is becoming super popular. Um, and the conservation district I participated this year was a grow a row project. We're actually growing because of the conditions that we're in now, I grew food for food banks. Um, so I had fresh food for myself, but part of this was set aside so that I could help people who are now unemployed and have food security issues. So um, food is a great way to use your space. Next. We um, just to, to tally on that, the, the, the first Nohomish Conservation District, the Plants a Row program, we have uh, the, the way that we sort of incentivize that is we actually give you a lot of supplies. If you are getting ready to start mm -hmm. going into that, uh, we will give you uh, fertilizer, we will give you supplies, we will give you technical assistance, we will give you seeds, um, and we're not asking for everything back. We just want to make sure that some of that is going to get donated to a local food bank. Uh, please contact us if you are interested in that. The other thing uh, that's become really important this year for everybody is relaxation. So I literally worked on my yard for 15 years before I put seating out in it. It was always a place of chores as opposed to a place of relaxation. Uh, this year it really paid off that I finally paid attention to that because uh, we're on remote work and actually our department's on remote work for everyone uh, so or forever. And so I can take my laptop and my little device and sit outside when the weather's nice. It, when you're isolated that I cannot tell you how soothing that is. So as you're planning your yard, think about that aspect of it. Is there something you want to do to, uh, to relax? Next. And uh, Sarah, I see who should I contact? We'll have a conservation district link uh, so that you can go on the conserva conservation district website. One of the big important things is to know your style. So on the left is sort of a cottage garden style. And then on the right is very formal garden in France. I was there, I can't even remember when. I don't remember time anymore like everybody else. I think it was the year before last. Uh, so for some people, I really love the effusive cottage garden style. The formal, eh, not so much, but it is some people's style. So you really should kind of page through Pinterest or things online and take a look and decide what your style is first because you'll want to pick plants and arrange your yard to actually suit your style. Next. Hang on. There we go. Okay, um, I think this uh, is my section. I will talk about uh, doing a little bit of mapping. Um, I am the, the big map nerd around the district. Um, so we're gonna talk about some kind of basics of what you want to do um, in order to, to pull together a very quick uh, functional map for yourself. So a map does not need to be, um, you know, uh, a a massive database run through ArcGIS. Um, more often it's gonna be something done on uh, line paper, graph paper, if you're feeling fancy, um, that is just functional for you. It does not need to be comprehensive. Nobody really needs to understand it besides you. As long as it works for you, it works. 
Um, you want to know the rules. You want to know where you are. You want to know what you can and cannot do. Um, and you want to know critically when you can ask or when you need to ask for help. Um, easement conditions and right of way, it's important to know from your municipality how far the right of way extends into your yard um, so that you don't end up building something in the right of way that the city is going to come and tear out. Um, it's, it's similarly very important to know if you have any critical areas on your parcel, um, slopes that need to be retained, creeks that may be protected, wetlands and protected waters are almost always protected, um, and then native growth protection areas. Um, what you do not want to do is to skip that step, do something that impacts one of those, and then face either a fine or a cost to repair it. You and can, D David, yeah. can I add something to that? I will tell everybody without fail when we've had these in-person classes, somebody comes up and says that they have received a notice of violation from their county or their city on or they've had a lawsuit from their neighbor. This is, there is an outcome to not knowing the rules that's actually a little bit painful. Yeah. So doing that research is really, really helpful to save you money, stress. It is so stressful to go through these things for people. Um, and then you're helping the environment but, and your neighbors by, by just kind of complying. And one of the safest ways to find out that information is to talk to the conservation district. We are 100% non-regulatory. Um, we will not get you in trouble for asking a question. I know that sometimes it can seem a little bit scary um, to invite you know, like the county or a municipality out because you're worried that they're gonna see something that you're gonna get you know, fined for in some way. The conservation district doesn't fine anything. We don't enforce any rules or regulations. Um, I have been on several site visits where I have had to gently tell people, okay, well, what you're doing right now is technically illegal. So before you get fined, let's talk about a solution so that you don't get in trouble. Um, that is a big part of what we are here for. So please, if you do think that, you know, you may have one of these areas and you wanna be just doubly sure, please reach out to us and ask. Uh, while you are finding property info, you have uh, for King and Snohomish County, you have two really great resources, uh, King County IMAP and Scopey. Um, Scopey is Snohomish County uh online parcel information yes online property information um it just got a recent if you've tried to use scopy maybe about two years ago and were completely frustrated with it i have great news uh last year it underwent a massive update and is significantly better now um, i used it for a really long time and it wasn't the best software uh in 2019 which wow okay no 2019 was now two years ago um it, uh, it, was, it was updated and it's much more user-friendly. King County IMAP is fantastic. King County IMAP has a lot of those, um, those layers like protected areas already loaded in. Scopey may or may not, but if you find your parcel on Scopey, you can have enough information to then go out and find the rest of the information that you do need. Um, so they're both great resources um, and I strongly recommend uh, using either or both of them. So um, your neighbors really matter when you think about your landscaping. This is the other thing I experience a lot because I do, I support public outreach in neighborhoods for community projects. And one of the things that we find is that people's landscaping projects can either be over a line, a uh, block of view, the plants can be crawling over fences and you can create a lot of neighbor problems. You can also benefit from your neighbor's yard. Um, and so next, David. Sorry, I am having some issues with the interface on here. I apologize to everyone, I'm a little bit behind. Oh, that's okay. Um, that's totally right. fine. Uh, so what you want to do is look at your neighbors. Uh, if they're the castle in the upper right, you may not want to see their castle. And if possible, you may want to put in a beautiful hedgerow that flowers all year, and then you're not looking at the castle. On the other hand, your neighbor may have a tree that is beautiful flaming red in the fall and you don't want to lose sight of that. So you do want to look around at your neighbors when you're making that map and see if there's something that you want to preserve in the view or something that you don't. If they do have a view and you're in a protected view shed, you have to be very careful about planting things that will block that view shed. So when we site facilities and do landscaping 
for King County projects, we have to check if they're protected view sheds because we can't block that, okay? Uh, the other thing you want to think about is, is your plan going to affect their home? Are you going to have a tree that's growing up and they have overhead utilities or you're shading their house or you start to shade their food garden? So you really do need to look at your neighbors. If you have a good relationship with them and you're close by, it's good to talk to them. If you're at a distance, I am. And quite frankly, I have fence line neighbors, but most of my neighbors, the nearest house is half a mile away. So I have fewer considerations like that, but you will have considerations if you're in a tight neighborhood. The one thing I can highly recommend is that uh, you do look to see if you have a survey for your property, a certified recorded survey, and you know where that property line is. IMAP, any of these online mapping is not exact for your lines, and you're going to want to know where that line is and have monuments in there. I have a coworker who put in a fence and it was literally six inches over the property line and the neighbor protested and uh, he had to move the whole new fence. Yeah, it was very expensive. So knowing where your property line is really helpful. And then as I mentioned earlier, easements, understanding if you have an easement, if it's a utility or railroad or a public right of way or your neighbors is super important. Come on. It'll get there. Okay, it'll catch up. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going to hand this to David. Obviously, we're a utility, and I'll come back and, and tell you horror stories. But David's going to talk about how to avoid messing with your utilities when you're making your yard plan. So um, yeah, as the infrastructure person, um, utilities are a huge part of what we think about anytime we do, uh, we do these installations. Without fail, you need to be calling 811. Um, it is, it's free, it is uh, very easy to do, and it's going to save you so much time and money. How much time and money? Um, a single broken water line, because it wasn't where you thought that it was, uh, can cost mm -hmm. you anywhere from four to $12,000 mm -hmm. um, in repairs. And 811, on the other hand, costs five minutes of your time to make the call and 24 hours for them to, or sorry, 48 hours now uh, for them to come out and actually do the marking. Um, you can let me know if your time is, if your 48 hours is worth more than $12,000, <laughs> like to know whatever business you're in. Um, it's, it's just a great idea. Additionally, you need to be considering everything above ground as well. Um, telephone lines, um, uh, 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 power transmission lines, all of that stuff the best way to sort of avoid PUD coming out and having a problem with you is to imagine a big pipe 10, about 10 feet in diameter around every single individual pipe um, or every single individual line and know that you can't plant anything that is going to violate that pipe. There is nothing worse than, and this has happened to, to friends of mine, than being so happy getting these beautiful trees, um, getting them installed, having them grow up over the course of two years and then having a PUD chipper truck come by and just cut the top right off of it. And your nice, beautiful uh, magnolia now just looks like it, it, it's been decapitated. Um, plan, plan ahead. Again, this is where maps come in really handy. Um, you also really want to locate your hardscape thoughtfully. Um, there was a trend, I think, back in the 80s to protect all of your um your pipes and stuff by just putting like a walkway directly over it so you would you know run all of your utilities out to the house and then you'd put a sidewalk over it and it was like great now you know we can't accidentally destroy it in some way that's true um but uh you hitting it with a shovel is not the only thing that harms utilities and it similarly gets significantly more expensive if you have to start tearing up uh, flagstone or tearing up concrete to get to your water main. And I'm going to say for us, uh, that is a huge issue. You also, if you are out, like in Seattle, you may be landscaping in the right of way. You're expected to maintain it. Um, do know if there are utilities in that right of way, like ours, our sewer. Um, they're going to, you're going to need to work with us on what you put over it. We don't want a sewer pipe with a great big heavy tree over it. Um, and so you're going to want to think about it on your own yard and then also in the right of way. 
And then because, so this is, this is not uh, necessarily an issue for folks that are living in the wastewater district, but for the other folks that are coming in from elsewhere, um, know where your septic line is. Uh, know where your septic line is, know where your septic tank is. All of that, all of that stuff about, you know, oh, don't plant over the septic or don't plant over a drain field. That's, that's real. <laughs> there is, I, I have had to, uh, in my younger days as a landscaper, have had to cut out cottonwood trees that had their roots growing into septic. Um, you do not want to be involved in that. That is the worst smelling wood you have ever cut in your entire life. Um, and it's a massive problem. Septic takes are expensive and roots go towards water. So if they manage to get into a septic tank and you have to cut it back out, replacing a septic tank also gets very expensive. Don't risk it, don't plant over septic. Speaking of. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so Beth just mentioned roots can grow into your pipes. And these are pictures from our system. We, uh, not from our pipes, but when we have dug up residential systems in projects that are next to projects, as David said, roots know where there are there's water coming and then once they crack these pipes i didn't put the picture in because it was too gross uh, the other thing you can get is you can get rodents coming up they will detect food uh, and waste coming in that's quite nutritious to them so i don't know if everybody knew but uh, in our area mercer island which has a lot of iv problems has the highest number of rat in the toilet calls that come in in the middle of the night so it just, um, I could show you pictures, they're horrible. Um, but this is what can go wrong when you're not minding your utilities and uh, they end up getting cracked, blocked and things like that. And it's very expensive to replace them. So, so that 811 can't say it enough. Yeah, I, and, and there's, there's a note on here that I had missed previously. Do take photos of wherever the lines are. Um, you want to do that for a couple of reasons. One is that stuff, the, the, the paint that they use is meant to wash away. Um, it is going to fade. Utility locates are only valid for any kind of excavation for 90 days. And I actually think it may be down to 45 after they're painted. Um, but the lines will disappear long before that. So you want to have a record as to where those lines are. But this one, unfortunately, I've had to do as well. If lines are inco incorrectly located, and you end up hitting something that wasn't where the, the, the marking said it was, you need to have some kind of documentation that the, that the marking was incorrect so that you're not liable. Um, that is not something I say lightly. I'm not the kind of person who thinks that we should be going out of our way to get people in trouble, but th that has happened to me a couple of times, um, specifically with gas lines, um, which is not something to mess around with. So take photos, mark, put down flags, whatever you have to do. Um, really pay attention to those 811 locates. Uh, so then going back to the map, um, we've scared you all uh, silly about everything that can go wrong if you, you know, don't map in utilities. What your map needs to have, um, your property boundary, again, Scopy or um, uh, IMAP is good in a pinch. Um, but if you're going to do it, be in, if you're going to be doing anything probably within two feet of the property line, you need to really see about having an actual survey. Right of way and easements, that's information that you're going to get from your, uh, from your municipality. Paths, this is sort of where you want the paths to be. Views, again, this is your view shed as well as try to consider your neighbor's view shed as well. Um, I know that it seems strange, you know, like, oh, consider their view, uh, view shed it really can affect property values. Um, and it's just kind of a good neighborly thing to do is to try to make sure that you're at least collaborating with them. You know, if you don't hate your neighbors, it might not be a bad idea to, you know, knock on their door or no, actually I take that back. Don't knock on their door right now. Um, drop them a note in a Ziploc bag and a pair of gloves that says, um, you know, this is, I'm, I'm getting ready to do some landscaping. Can we chat really quickly about, you know, stuff that you need and stuff that I need to make sure that everything lines up. It's just kind of a neighborly thing to do. Uh, your utilities, again, get it marked with 811, put it on your map, take photos. The existing vegetation, that should be fairly easy to map where things are. And then other site, uh, uh, site constraints, um, including critical areas, um, things that are restricted, any slopes that need to be protected or need to be, um, or if any slopes are increased, how you need to address those slopes. 
um, any sort of septic fields, like I said, and then wet areas. We're gonna talk about soil and soil hydrology a little bit later, um, but just keep in your mind that this needs to include any kind of areas that are uh, seasonally wet um, or perennially. Monica, is this? Uh, I'll start. Um, so, and then we'll we'll just figure out where we're going next. Right. We, we're used to doing we're this doing together good. in person we're, and looking at each other. <laughs> even even last year, we managed to sneak this in before you know like yep. stuff really started. And we're used to like both having a clicker and kind of being able to be in the same room and like watching each other talk. So I swear, folks, like we really are good at this normally. It's just completely <laughs> awkward. Plus, we also get to look at you. I'm not enjoying Zoom for that reason. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. it's so much easier to, to, to be able to look at you guys and like have you raise your hands and play off of you guys. I have no idea if any of my jokes are working, which is just a <laughs> thing so um, so we've talked about mapping things out as a way of preventing future problems, but there's some other things you may want to consider. And you, so what you really need to do is get out in your yard and see if you have anything that could be a problem now and you're going to want to avoid these uh, problems in the future. So um, next. So one of the things that David and I cannot emphasize enough, and I think you've heard this, uh, is to get technical help. Oops, it's scrolling, David. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to close out the, the chat there. I think Okay, um, so really to know when you need technical help, okay? Anytime you're moving water around, a drainage project, a rain garden, uh, slopes and retaining walls are a big one here because you can cause very serious problems in liability. We talked about utilities and working around waterways and uh, other utilities that don't belong to you, not just yours. So David, you want to pick that up? Yeah, so a, a, a quick rundown is anytime you're, so we have a, a phrase that water always wins. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to stop water from doing whatever water wants to do. You are free to travel to the Grand Canyon and ask how it, how, how it did with that. Um, the, instead, you were, your best goal is to sort of guide water so that it doesn't damage the things that you don't want it to damage. Um, similarly, retaining walls, slopes are heavy. Retaining walls are kind of difficult. Uh, retaining walls pretty much put me through college. So I, <laughs> I, I, really, I really can say that they're not, they're not necessarily intuitive or easy to just sort of toss together. They may look like it, but um, it's something you really want to get assistance on. We'll get into some of these in more details, but I want to take this uh, opportunity again to encourage you, contact the Conservation District. Site visits are free. Consultations are free. We are funded by uh, uh, taxes for that. Um, you, we, we will be able to at least give you some advice on how these, um, on, on how to avoid making really dangerous and costly mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, going back to what I was saying about kind of where stuff needs to be, uh, um, uh, planted, um, how you want stuff to, to, to be organized. Hardscapes are one of those things that are going to be down for a very long time, simply because they are very difficult to tear up. Um, on the far left there, you have bricks. I've made, I've made a bunch of both of those types of paths. The one on the left is difficult because it's a lot of cutting bricks and carefully laying um, and leveling and things like that. They're very expensive to put down and you don't wanna have them disrupted as possible. The one on the top right there um, is actually stamped concrete. Um, that is faster, but it's much more difficult to get up. You're talking about a jackhammer, you're talking about a dump trailer, you're talking about multiple trips to the dump. So when you do get ready to put down hardscape, you need to make sure this is something that I'm gonna be comfortable with for the next probably 10, 15 years. Um, and if I see that changing, I should probably incorporate that into my design now. Um, similarly, hardscapes contribute to runoff. They are not permeable surfaces. Um, they, are, they will drain to whatever is nearby. So you need to consider when it starts raining, and I mean this last couple weeks, um, the, the last few weeks in December and this first week in uh, January, We've had some incredible rains. I think at one point, um, the spot where I live got about a half an inch in under an hour, um, which is 
inc really truly incredible. And when that rain comes down and hits one of those surfaces, where is the water going to go? Similarly, when talking about planting trees, similar to water always wins, roots usually win. <laughs> um, they, they will tear up brick very quickly. They will bust through concrete. They're just slower, stronger, and far more stubborn. So um, it's not impossible. Street trees are definitely a thing, but again, you have to be thoughtful about it. Um, if you're not clear on, if, you, if you're just absolutely in love with this idea of having like a nice brick line path with trees on every side, that's not impossible. Um, but do some research, talk to us, uh, see how you can kind of make that work um, and be ready to sort of change your mind. Um, planting with growth in mind, these are the two sort of major options that you have is plant dense and thin or plant full um, or uh, 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 plant thin and then keep weeds down. I will tell you that I am a big proponent for planting for full growth and then working on weeds. Why? Because taking up weeds is much, or uh, uh, suppressing weeds and taking weeds out is much, much simpler than taking out full grown uh, plants. Um, I understand that they don't always aesthetically look great. If you time your planting well, you may have to look at some bare spots for a year, maybe two, and then afterwards you will uh, reduce your input by a lot. Um, you'll notice in the bottom right there, there's a, a thick layer of mulch um, over those plants. Mulching with native wood chips or um, some kind of uh, good attractive uh, uh, um, barrier, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, wood chip amendment um, or mulch is going to help suppress weeds by a lot. Um, and there's a right way and a wrong way to do that with plants, but it is definitely going to help both your soil health and keep the weeds down. Um, and like I said, you only have to do it for a couple of years. If you do decide that you go, no, I want to plant dense and then come back, just be aware that as those things grow up, you're either going to have plants that get shaded out and killed, you're going to have issues with them becoming overgrown, and you're going to either hire somebody or spend a lot of time coming back and taking full grown plants out and then have a plan for those plants. Either they're going to be composted, um, you have friends that are going to take them, um, you have a local nursery that needs them. They're going to go into um, a farm upstate where they can chase rabbits. But you do need to have some kind of some kind of plan for that. And I can uh, add to that. Uh, King County has changed their restoration, how we restore landscapes. So we used to restore dense, but what we found out is that's about the least cost effective thing you can do. Because the other thing that happens is when you plant dense like that, those plants are all competing for nutrients and water. So the target plants that you wanna keep over time don't grow as well. So it's better to do the kind of plant for full growth and kind of deal with it later, deal with the weeds and then let everybody grow into their full height. They'll get there faster is what we found than if you try to plant them super dense so it looks like you have ground cover. If you're hiring landscape architects, we work with our landscape architects. One of the things that we always fight with them is they wanna put in a pile of species and really close together and the problem is, is that plants grow and they compete with each other and you're going to lose your most sensitive species if you do that too. So if you have something that's really sensitive, you've got to give it space to be able to survive. So you do have these two options um, and we wanted to let you know about that, but I think you're hearing David and I both kind of lean toward the plant for full growth and keep the weeds down until things get there. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about soil and amendments. Um, but it, in, to my mind, there really is one, uh, um, uh, a right way and a wrong way to approach this. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, when you are thinking about what kind of plants, some plants do not want to stay put. Um, this is uh, Carex, it's a version of Carex called Ice Dance. Um, it gets very large. Um, th this is, so this is an interesting species because it can be subdivided very easily. Um, mm -hmm. and people who know that tend to take one of these big bushes and go, great, I'm going to get a bunch of little small ones out of this big bush 
and then put them along um, uh, along my path to have these little nice grass sprouts you see on the left. That's great, except that those little sprouts don't stay that size. They then turn into a massive thicket of this. Now, if this is what you're going for, great. Um, and they will self-regulate to a degree once they kind of start to crowd each other out, they'll stop. Um, but they are going to grow to whatever space that you give them and they're not gonna be particularly considerate of other plants. So you really do need to be careful and, un and when you are looking at plants, it will tell you the full growth, for the, the full growth size and what's called the growth habit. Um, which is how they tend to grow in what shape. Um, anything that is uh, a spreading grass is going to spread. That goes double after this year, maybe triple for bamboo. Um, I think that if I could ban one plant from the shores of, uh, no, it'd be morning glory. If I could ban one plant from Washington state entirely, it would be morning glory. Um, bamboo would be a, a a, a close second um, because it gets massive. Clumping bamboo does not always stay clumping bamboo. Uh, when it says clumping bamboo, it means in its home climate. Um, it does all bets are off when you start when you when you change climates for a plant. Um, and bamboo is incredibly difficult to get rid of. I strongly encourage you if you really like bamboo, if you think bamboo is just amazing and you love the aesthetic of it, I love the aesthetic of it. Um, and you want to have it outdoors in your yard, there are ways to do that with container gardening that will not completely destroy you and your neighbor's yawn. Lawn, please do not put bamboo in native soil. It is almost always spreading and it is almost always impossible to control once it gets out. And that is one of those plants. I have a friend who lives in uh, Kirkland and uh, they actually prohibit you putting bamboo in the ground. Um, Seattle actually has an approved tree list. Um, I'll talk about it in the native plant session. It, you really need to check what's allowed in your area because there are restrictions on things so that you don't get away and cause problems to asphalt and utilities. So let's go on to the next. Uh, so one of the things you really need to think about as well as you're planning when we talk about full growth is having a path. Um, so this is actually my driveway. I live in, I have a, a flood control dike on one side of me and I have to drive in on the top of it. And so you can see if I get stuff planted too close to the driveway, I'm gonna end up scratching my car. Or you can have where you park, you might, you know, you come in, you park, and then suddenly you've got aspen trees dripping sap on your vehicle and on you. So you really need to think about access to your home. Next. And the access is not just for your vehicle. It's uh, next. Uh, there we go. Okay. It's going to be for you to get back and forth to the recycling with a wheelbarrow, get to your garden. Uh, do you need play areas and access for that? Do you want sitting areas like I talked about? You're going to have to be able to get to them. If you have a perimeter screen, you need to think about being able to get to your fence. If you look in the upper left, that fence is going to need maintenance over time and you're going to need to be able to get there. Um, I see somebody commented on... Um, on emergency vehicles, that is also something, you know, you need to make sure that people can get to your house. Uh, I will always have limitations because I live in floodplain, right? Um, I will never have giant vehicles coming in. If some people are like that on very narrow city streets, but where you can plan that access out pretty early. Next. Uh, real quick, I wanna say, Carly, um, talking about plastic pro uh, products, weed barriers and stuff like that, um, I will be happy to talk about that a little bit in soils. Um, I will not talk in depth about that because we only have so much time. All right. Okay. There we go. Uh, so safe access to your house is another thing. This is my house. Um, and there were a bunch of shrubs that were in front of the door. And I was doing a lot of remodeling projects. My house is from 1908 and really struggling to get in the door with stuff. And I thought, oh, this is just not working. And so I really cut back what was in front of the door so that I could actually get into my house. But one of the things I realized, and it's a site security issue, is that those shrubs on the left, if I don't live in the city, I live in the country, right? Uh, somebody could stand behind there and I would not have seen them coming home at night from work. 
Okay, so you really want to make sure that you can see your front door, see your back door, and make sure that you have that site access and security. Next. And then you also want to find the right path, okay? And think about that over time. So there's a number of different paths you can use, and people tend to think of them by style. Um, I will tell you, I had horses and I ended up with a young in life hip replacement. Uh, so I can tell you that um, you have to be really careful with paths because you can have trip hazards. If you start out at a property and you're young and nimble, but you're gonna age in place, what path you have in place may make a difference whether you can get around your property at a certain point or not, or if you have a, an injury or super athletic. So really think about the path for your uses. And then, like I said, if you're gonna have parents come live with you or something like that, make sure that they can get around your property too. Next. I will note as well, um, if you do really <clears throat> consider what you are going to use this path for and when you are going to be using it, um, I have installed or seen people install a number of like nice flagstone or brick paths um, that go out to their mailbox and encourage them to think about if you are going to be walking out here first thing in the morning barefoot, consider sort of, you know, hitting one of those stones that isn't set perfectly um, or the edge of a brick in a barefoot. Um, try to try to consider not just how you're going to be using it, but when you're going to be using it um, and if you're going to be barefoot or not. Okay. Uh, so similarly, um, this massive monstrous, some might say rhododendron, um, another thing to consider temporally uh, is not just how large these plants are going to get, but what size they're going to be when they get large enough. Um, they, you need to offset these things from the edge of your house. Um, a shrub that is a nice shrub now and you want to put it right next to your house because you don't like the color or something like that is going to get bigger um, and it is going to start becoming problems. Uh, you can see one, um, if there was any sort of damage, this house, it would be very difficult for this to, um, uh, for, for them to access any point. Um, depending on the roots, it could start to upset the foundation. Uh, you are providing access from a number of different um, uh, creatures to get into your house, especially into crawl spaces or attics. Um, you also notice that it is disrupting the power line into the house, or I think that might be a communication line. Um, consider how large things are going to get and you want to move them back uh, away um, so that they can grow up to their full size without um, actually damaging your house. Uh, and if you move into a place and notice that uh, people did not take this advice, try to take care of it immediately. Um, if, if you think to yourself, well, it's too expensive right now, uh, it's going to get more expensive. Um, if you have an older tree that you think, well, this is a full mature tree, it's, you know, it's a, a big Douglas fir that uh, is going to, you know, it, it's, it's going to cost way too much to bring it down. Wait until a good windstorm when that thing comes down and the roots take out a big chunk of your foundation with it. Um, or, uh, you know, a, a good sized, uh, if it's a, it's a, a big cedar, uh, windstorm comes along and gets the branches moving and it takes out one of your windows. Um, it, it is, it, most arborists will um, <laughs> give you a free estimate. Um, it is worth it to go ahead and have them come out and just find out how much it's going to cost you. Yeah, so one of the things that's really important, David just referred to this, is knowing which way the wind blows. So this is my neighbor's house. Uh, we had a huge wind that came in from a direction it does not usually. It was about 65 miles an hour. You can see that the tree was pruned up and very like poodle dog tail on the top. So the wind caught it, snapped it off. That is a really nice new roof that it landed on. Um, so when you're looking at a property, especially in Western Washington, I can't say for our Kentucky visitor what that's like, but in Western Washington, you'll have a prevailing wind. Um, coming toward your house. And so, and we get a lot of wind and we can have massive windstorms. If anybody's new here at all, we have had 100 mile an hour windstorms. They happen rarely, but they do occur. And when you start to get 50, 60, it's getting high. So you really need to kind of track which way the wind blows. Next. 
Uh, so this is my house. Uh, one of the things that and uh, we had a problem with was th there were three giant cherry trees. This is, David will talk about, we don't have the soil type for cherries and David will talk about soil types. So they really didn't grow any roots. Huge windstorms came. All three of them eventually came down. Uh, all three of them thankfully missed the house, but then you have to go through this huge effort to cut them up and pull them out. They damage other plants on the way out. They can damage your house. Um, and then all of a sudden my whole yard changed. It was like this shade garden suddenly was in scorching sun and all the plants got exposed. So it's something you really wanna think about. I wish I had pulled the tree out earlier. If I had known they were all three gonna come down, I would have taken them out when they were smaller the year I moved in. Next. I will, I will note real quick for any kind of fruit trees um, that are not native to here, not only do we not have the soil type to help them get healthy, but we also have a number of fungi Mm -hmm. um, that uh, can make them very diseased and unhealthy. Um, mm -hmm. If you if you did inherit some uh, some fruit trees, um, take very good care of them um, and think critically as to whether or not you want to keep them around. They may be a liability. Yep, and there are newer varieties that are not as bad. They can, we can talk about that in a later session. So if you think about removing trees, I had to remove, uh, I've already removed four that were planted like you saw the earlier picture David showed right on my foundation. Bad idea. Uh, you don't want to do that. Uh, check if you have a tree protection ordinance. So the cities are starting to protect um, their trees because a lot of these evergreen trees in our area, which is really soggy, are taking up hundreds of gallons of water a day during the winter time, right? They really control water in your area. And they're trying to keep a tree canopy for shade and habitat. Um, if your tree is a hazard tree, so this one is causing moss problems on my roof, and I love the tree, but it was like literally planted right toward the house, like all the other ones were. You do want to get people who are qualified. If you did not know as a homeowner, I'm about to get my roof replaced. Um, you actually are responsible for things like worker safety and environmental protections, making sure everybody has the right permits. It is not on the contractor. It is on you as a property owner. It's the same thing for us as King County. We have to make sure that we have all our permits in place and all our permissions and we've reviewed everything. So uh, removing a tree may be necessary if it's a hazard tree. This one's perfectly healthy, but you can see they uh, hardscaped over the roots. So the roots are really unhealthy. And in that same windstorm that my neighbor had the tree tip on his house, this one actually lifted up on the side facing you. And the only reason that tree did not end up tipping on my house is the front porch railing caught it. So I could, we don't have a tree protection ordinance, but if we did, I could file and say, this is a hazard tree. It's about to come down on my house and it can't grow and be healthy here. Next. Um, I do want to note that if you are going to look at removing any trees, um, I know I seem like a shill for big arborist at this point, but anything taller than you, an arborist needs to come mm -hmm. out of the um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not just safety. In a lot of cases, um, you, can, you can put yourself in hot water if you try to remove a tree yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing you'll really want to do on your property, um, and David mentioned site visits, it's something you can do and you can also do in Google Maps, you can make the sun go over your property as you're looking in Google Earth at your property. Um, but really know where is it soggy? Where is it dry? Where does the wind come from? Because that's going to dry out your plants. Where does the sun shine? Are there trees hanging over things that are going to get bigger and shade stuff out? So you really want to look at the conditions you have on the ground so you know when you start to purchase plants that you're getting the plants that will survive in those conditions. Like I said, I kind of had it together with my shade garden until my tree fell down. But everything that was in that shade garden could deal with that giant cherry tree over them. So you really wanna kind of understand what you're dealing with. Wet conditions don't necessarily mean you have to start draining your property. I'm gonna tell you, if you find you've got a, a boggy area of your property and it's not near um, a, a utility, it's maybe a great place for wet loving plants, right? So, um, so there are some things you can do with that, but make sure you've mapped that out. There are a lot, of, uh, a lot of plants that really enjoy moist soils and can actually help remediate some of those wet spots by growing up and taking some of that water. Yep. Come on. 
All right. I'm the there. elves are bicycling as fast as they can. Uh, yeah, they're doing their best, I guess. So now we'll transition from, we sound like we're like all gloom and doom, but we've helped you actually kind of <laughs> plan out where you're going to actually uh, landscape and hardscape. And uh, we've talked about like evaluating your conditions and making sure you are avoiding future problems by getting rid of stuff that's a problem now or avoiding it yourself in the future. So now we'll transition into a little bit lighter subject. Uh, so it's some design tips and there's some basic concepts in landscaping that can help you even in a small space, make it look bigger and richer without having to acquire more land. Yeah, we swear, we swear that this is fun. Um, yeah, it is totally it's fun. It's as bad as we've made it up. Um, yeah, I just want you not to be the neighbor on the project I have where they're like, I have a problem. Um, <laughs> so one of the things is to think really creatively about your garden space. We tend to think that we have to plant everything in the ground and that it's a one dimensional project. You can have all sorts of really cool stuff that defines your yard. It can be very personal. Um, I've seen people have little signs to family members that like their grandmother who's passed. There's a lot that you can do that makes your garden space really a rich place. And it's not just planting everything in the ground in a square rectangle. So you can be on a, a patio. I've worked, actually, I worked with an apartment complex in Bellingham that did hummingbird gardens on everybody's patio. It was just gorgeous. And they had hummingbirds everywhere and they were even nesting. Um, on the lower right, this is, these are becoming really trendy. You can find them now at Home Depot here. Uh, these uh, metal horse troughs. This is a pea patch in Ballard. So people will use raised beds. This is actually super helpful because fun fact, rabbits can't climb these. Uh, I've had to start using my old horse troughs now that my horses are gone because I'm getting a lot of rabbits. I actually used an old beat up, chewed up plastic horse trough from my, after my last horse passed. And I have this giant pile of jeans. I swear I'm doing this Pinterest picture in the lower left. There's a lot of really fun and creative stuff that you can do, and it will make your space look a lot richer. I mean, if you're in a, a homeowners association with a covenant that says you have to have a really tidy front yard, do the creative stuff in your backyard, but do think about personalizing and making it less like it's a, a, a hotel lobby. It's, you know, this is one of the things I think of as some of the yards look like hotel lobbies. Uh, those metal horse troughs, by the way, are good for bamboo. If you do want to plant bamboo outside, the roots have a, like, they're very sturdy. The roots have a very hard time getting through them. Yeah. So one of the ways that you can actually, this is a really simple concept to it, just expanding a sense of space. You can have a very, very small space. On the upper right is a Japanese garden in New Zealand. And what you see, everything in there, there's like one straight line or two straight lines. There's a lot of curving lines. And then you see tall things in the background receding away from you. This is having a curving line and on the lower paths, you see that. Even in a teeny yard, having a path disappear, your brain always thinks there's something around the corner. Okay, so doing the absolute rectangle or square where you can see everything in plain sight will make that space look smaller. Certainly never put tall things right in front of you, put them in the back, and then you'll want to have, you see in that Japanese garden, from say a seating area or your home, your window, you're gonna to wanna to have low things in the front and then have them gradually like a wave get taller toward the back and then have the tallest things at the back. So this is one cheap and easy way to make your postage stamp yard look much larger than it actually is. Next. Uh, so layering. So this is something that you can use to um, uh, get rid of that uh, that that feeling of you know sort of emptiness between the different uh, between different plants. You can use ground covers, which will stay obviously very close to the ground. Uh, shrubs and uh, 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 forbs, which will be kind of to the medium uh, height, and then trees to create canopy over the top of them. Plants don't grow all at one level; they grow at several levels, um, and you can kind of figure out how to structure them 
um, as well as plant them together so that they, um, they look a lot more full when they start out and then will grow into something uh, much larger. Uh, so this uh, is a list of great resources for um, a number of different places to find out the, all the information about plants. I've been talking about growth habit, size, uh, soil moisture, full versus partial sun. Uh, Burke Museum right here is a great way to, uh, uh, a great place to look. USDA database, also very good. Um, it tends to look, uh, it, it tends to talk about hardiness and hardiness zones. Um, which is uh, a great way to kind of see what might be wor uh, uh, worth working in your um, area. Uh, great Plant Picks is a website that I tell almost everybody. Um, very easy. And one thing you can do is you can look through their pre-sorted lists and see like, I need to plant something under a dug fir. They have a list for planting under, under, under conifers. I want something that is you know, native and red. They have a list of plants that you can sort by color that are natives. Okay, so um, you have finished your planning. Congratulations. Um, now what? What are you gonna do? Um, you've got everything laid out on a map. Um, what is step two? Yeah, so you have to, as you're thinking forward, you have to think about how you're gonna get started, right? So you can either do a fast pace and tear the whole yard out and start, or you can go slow, try to kill your lawn for a year. There's a number of different approaches you can have to getting started. Next. And so the first thing you'll wanna think about is how you prepare that space, right? So um, are you going to start in containers? Are you gonna try, I on the upper right, this is how I take mine. I do a lot of uh, paper and cardboard boxes and stuff like that and I'll plant and just choke out the lawn okay I have also taken six mil plastic not the best I don't like putting plastic in the environment and in this area if you put it down for a year you can also choke out a lawn right you may want to dig the whole thing up it depends on how much effort you want to put into it um, a lot of preparation we talked about rain gardens and ponds anything with water may take design permitting, technical assistance, acquiring a contractor. So you're gonna need a lot of lead time for that. And what we'll do um, after this is also send you, we have a little checklist for your project, like what do you need to think about and what do you need to do, which is kind of a checklist. It's a template you can use. That's a summary of what we're doing now. If you do wanna use, uh, if you don't wanna use plastic, come on. If you don't want to use plastic, uh, you can use uh, mulch um, or uh, sheet mulching, uh, newspapers, cardboard, things like that. Um, so yeah, landscape fabric, it stops some weeds, not all of them, especially if they're shallow rooting. Um, it's very terrible on a, on a slope. It's not permeable, so it will cause issues with water. Um, and it does cause really, issue, uh, really terrible issues with gardening in the future. Um, so we're going to talk about soils. Uh, so healthy soil is kind of the number one thing that is going to help these plants establish and um, really uh, thrive um, in your backyard. Um, you probably don't intimately know your soil. That's okay. We're going to give you a few things to sort of get started as well as a bunch of resources for more in-depth reading. Soil science is, uh, can be very complicated. Um, you do not need to know any of these things. Uh, they are good resources, but you do not need to memorize this. What you do need to know is a little bit of soil chemistry. Um, you need to know that the nutrients that are in your soil matter and how your plants are gonna tell you what nutrients they have too much of or too little of. We really want you to test your soil. We want you to either contact the conservation district or possibly your local university or the USDA NRCS and say, you know, this is, this is a sample I took of my soil. Um, please help me figure out, you know, what I'm deficient in, what I need to do to remove it. Taking soil samples is pretty easy. You want to take a vertical sample. So you want to dig a hole and then basically take a slice out of the edge, record what is at different depths, um, and then uh, put uh, sample those soils up so that they can be sent off um, for lab testing. You can also get lab tests uh, for yourself if you want to do it yourself. They really are fun. I enjoy doing them. 
Um, you might need to, I think Amazon probably has some Home Depot or Lowe's might as well. Uh, an easy way to determine kind of what sort of soil you have generally is soil texture. Um, I'm a wetland scientist. I have a whole half degree in soil texture. Uh, no one's expecting you to do that. It's a lot simpler than that. Uh, silt feels kind of greasy. So if you dig it up and it feels like it's sort of an oily substance, um, you probably have very high silt soil. Sand feels very rough or sandy. Clay feels like clay. Hopefully we all know what clay feels like. And loam kind of feels like all of those or none of them. Um, it's kind of a weird mixture uh, of, of all three. Loam is really the sort of thing that you want. This is some good examples of clay, loam, sand, and silt. Um, we all know what sand, looks, uh, uh, sand and clay looks like. Silt is extremely fine. Um, and low is, loam is sort of that great topsoil that I think we're all really used to. What's most important about this is they, that is going to tell you uh, what you need in terms of moisture. Clay is going to be very wet, loam is going to be moist to well-drained, sand will be very well-drained, and silt will be anywhere from moist, wet to dry. When you're looking at plants, they will tell you this is how much soil, um, or th uh, this is what their water needs are, this is the kind of soil they want. It'll say things like they need well-drained soils, they need moist soils. Um, this is, is how you can kind of ballpark what your soil looks like. Um, Kristen, are you taking over, uh, not Kristen, sorry, Mata, are you taking over fertilizer or would you like me to keep going? Uh, no, keep going. I'm answering okay. questions in the chat. Wonderful. So fertilizer, um, there's a lot of different ways to do fertilization. Um, we have a horse manure share program that allows for some fertilization. Uh, if you do get that, we will help you actually install it because it can end up being dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Um, Chemical fertilizers or artificial fertilizer, everything's a chemical fertilizer. Artificial uh, fertilizers, we try to stay away from because they can actually do damage to roots or they can do damage to soil. There's a lot of very natural air quotes fertilizer options um, that are much better for amending your soils. Um, when you are looking at fertilization, you need to start with a soil test to determine what you need. Um, and you need to also understand in terms of quantity, uh, what you're going to put into it. Um, there's a, a terrible story that I'm afraid we don't have time to get into, but if people want to hear it um, about just sort of fertilizing your, your soil willy nilly, um, there's a person who I worked with who did something terrible. Uh, we were talking about mulch. Um, when you're adding mulch, you do want to add mulch to any sort of new plantings, especially trees, but you want to do it like on the right hand side, not on the left hand side. Um, if you do it on the left hand side, you're cutting off the root crown, you're actually probably going to kill that tree. Uh, versus if you do it on the right, you have a much better chance of actually neutrifying the roots and causing the, and helping the tree survive. Um, you don't want to have this stuff right up against uh, structures. Um, it's a great way for bugs and other invasives to get into those structures. Um, and you never want to have it touching at the, the, the siding of your house. Yeah, so it also, you saw the rot on those, that tree. If you yeah. start putting this stuff up against your house or against wood like this, it's going to happen to the wood. So, um, and welcome. Here's a carpenter ant. Yeah, they're terrible to get rid of. Um, so when you're setting yourself up for success, uh, you want to start with smaller plants. Smaller plants are cheaper. You probably want to bare root them so that they, uh, so that the, the roots are growing directly into the soil. But you do want to take time to amend the soil <laughs> so that uh, they will be um, growing into native soil that will be more neutrified. Um, use, compo uh, uh, use compost and mulch, and you also want to be watering them in. Go ahead and stick them in the ground, get this stuff over them, and then water them so that the, the root hairs are well preserved. And uh, I can say those are actually my plants. So one of the things that I do is I uh, buy bare root plants from the conservation district. I often will put them in pots over the summer and let them grow roots. Um, and then they get super healthy. And then I'm planting in the fall and winter. Next. Uh, so as I said, I plant in the fall and winter. I swear for safety purposes, I do not use this chair to climb up into my truck when it has dirt in it anymore. I used to, that was really dumb. Um, and so I have a tendency to prep by covering a whole section. You see I'm creating a hedgerow along the fence as the lower picture. 
I will do black plastic, uh, cardboard, paper, mulch on top of it and kind of choke out a whole area. I'm going to grow my plants and pots from spring to fall. And then I'm going to go ahead and plant in the fall because then they're going to grow roots all winter long. And this is what we found in King County. We do not plant during the summer at all because you have to put so much water on these plants to keep them going. It's just not worth your time. So and scheduling in the Pacific Northwest, this doesn't help our Kentucky visitor, but scheduling in the Pacific Northwest to plant during the fall, it is a wet and gloomy experience, but it actually works pretty efficiently. Yep, same in Snohomish. Uh, and then maintenance is a big deal. Um, you really do need to plan for maintenance. Like I said, I had a hip replace that became really entertaining. It turned up actually I had set my yard up for success so I could take some time off to get a fake part and uh, it worked pretty effectively. But you're gonna need to think about, are you doing it or hiring a landscaping service? If you age in place, have a child, get an injury, how are you gonna maintain your property? Uh, we've been chatting about Himalayan blackberry. I think everybody knows if you turn on it, if you turn away from Himalayan blackberry, it will like take over your house in a month. And somebody asked, is January, February a bad time to plant? No, it's great, do it. And uh, I'll talk in the native plant class. If you're gonna do live stakes, it's a great time to do it. And in fact, King County would be planting at this time if we were restoring property. Next. Uh, so integrated pest management, um, this is something you do want to be just kind of aware of. We're going to go into it um, in terms of in a, in a, a later class about wildlife and pests, um, but you do want to just be aware and do some reading um, beforehand as you're getting ready. You want to have a, a, a pest management plan for your yard always. Um, and just your yard is an ecosystem. It's a part of the ecosystem, but it's also its own ecosystem. Um, and by doing some of this stuff, you're all kind of becoming nascent ecologists. Um, you do want to um, understand how all the different energy and water flows work in your yard um, so that you're not surprised when doing something in one section affects another part of your yard or even your neighbor's yard. Uh, maintenance is absolutely vital. Uh, please be careful about um, uh, irrigation and sort of have a schedule for pulling stuff back. Um, you'll be, if you did stake up trees, be very careful about when you're removing them and make sure you're removing them in time. That uh, staked tree on the right there is girdled and that tree is probably going to die um, or at the very least it's going to be stunted. Um, if you schedule your, uh, your major maintenance, um, you, it's more likely to happen and minor maintenance as you go will reduce uh, emergency maintenance. Um, compost instead of fertilizer, companion planting, natural pest control. Man, I wish I had time to just dive into all of this stuff, but I wanna make sure that we wrap up the time for questions. Um, this is, we will talk more about this in sustainable gardening. This is very interesting stuff and I strongly recommend you come back to, to talk more. This could be an entire, this is an entire presentation on its own. And some of this we'll cover in other sessions, um, including the landscaping for wildlife and native plants. Yep. So we're gonna make sure that you get multiple bites at the apple on this one. Yep. Um, here are some more resources. Um, these will be included in the PDF. So you will have access to all of these. Do not try to write them down right now. Um, and with, uh, here's some additional soil resources. Um, most of these are just think the, the field test that I pulled out earlier in the triangle. And with a few minutes left over, a little bit behind schedule, let's open it up for questions. There is a question in the chat I wanted to address. Tracy feels overwhelmed. This is a big yeah. subject. So what we are gonna do, we will send you this presentation uh, and then we'll send you, like I said, a, a planning thing. Like, what do you have to think about? So you can start walking through it and then a list of resources and stuff. You can take a class, you can hire people if you want to go all native or do wildlife, there's a specialty, there is a cost to that and you may not want to do that. Um, certainly if you're in, you're in King County, so David could comment on whether King County is doing site visits or Snohomish County can stretch into King County for that. I know you have a collaborative agreement. Yeah. Um, there are two books that are local that I'll talk about in the native plant class I could really recommend. And one is The Landscaping for Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. The reason I recommend that is that you're going to get wildlife, um, whether you like it or not, if you have a healthy yard. But it actually is written by a biologist for fish and wildlife 
who has um, landscape architecture background. And there are a lot of landscape architecture books out there and sites that you can pursue just to make yourself comfortable before you hit stuff on the ground. So I'm gonna turn it to you, to David, to talk about resources. Yeah, um, I strongly suggest uh, Grow Your Own Native Landscape, um, which is a PDF you should be able to find for free. It was published by WSU. It's actually the, the textbook uh, that they teach for restoration ecology, uh, which is my degree from the University of Washington. It's free, it's a really great overview and a great reference text. Um, I strongly recommend, if, if you're gonna be doing any kind of native landscaping in this region, I strongly recommend that you at least have it as something you can turn towards. Um, if you are, my contact information is on this. If you feel more comfortable contacting me, and asking you know, for resources, I would be happy to connect you to King County and see if they have a solution. And if they don't have somebody that can directly help you, I can see about what we can do to help you. Uh, we're very close with, uh, with uh, King Conservation District. We trade resources all the time. Um, so we, we wanna make sure that we're just getting people to the right place. Um, and you know, I, I wanna acknowledge it's okay to be a little bit overwhelmed. This was basically a 90 minute slice of something that is both Monica and I's entire careers. Um, <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's, if you are feeling a little bit like, oh man, that was a lot of information, it was. Um, it definitely was. Um, and we're not gonna leave you just you know, hanging on that. We have other classes. Uh, we encourage you to come to us with questions. We're gonna get you guys more resources. You should not walk away from this feeling like you are now a professional landscaper. You should feel like you have kind of your, your feet under you and you know what questions you wanna ask or you know who to ask um, about what you should know next. And I wanna, so I'm gonna clip off a couple of these while we're still here. Um, uh, Anne asked, said, since summer is not a good time to plant, is there a good time to build, set up a garden main structure? That is a good time. And in fact, if you think you're gonna fry your yard with six mil plastic, during, do it during the summer when it's hot. <laughs> well, um, so you can actually get really set up during the summer and then plant during the winter when, you know, you're going to grow roots, you got free water coming out of the sky right now. So yeah, I would not plant plants, but it doesn't mean you can't do a whole lot more like get your beds and your structures in place. And if you're going to do any kind of ground disturbing activity, I strongly recommend you start it around June. Um, when the soil is dry, it'll be much easier to work with. It'll be much more safe um, and it will give you a much more lasting foundation. That's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and th there are so many resources. One of the things where th the reasons that we're kind of whipping through this, there's so many resources online and locally for you. We don't need to go into gruesome detail, just give you the things you need to consider and you will find a ton of stuff locally that you can work with. Um, we didn't get a chance to go in depth in soil and compost and mulch. People are asking questions about that. There was a, a whole presentation dedicated to that last year. And uh, Kristen can PDF it and send people a link so that you can look at that. Um, and David, I'm sure you have a lot of resources on site for proper application of, so of uh, compost and mulch. Yeah, we so we have uh, an entire urban agriculture and agriculture section that is dedicated to, whoops, there's a four in front of Grow Your Own Native Landscape. Um, sorry about that. Um, we, have, we have a lot of resources to how to amend your soils, how to uh, uh, create your own compost. Uh, contact us for that information. We're more than happy to, to, if you're everywhere from applying compost to making your own compost and how to apply it, safe composting and all that stuff, we're more than happy to help. And if you're interested in doing a soil test for your yard, I'll also include step-by-step -step instructions for how you actually go about taking the samples out of your yard and sending them in to get tested. Yes. Right. And I think you've got stuff online, David, about uh, compost and mulch as well. I think I found it um, yeah. on your site. So you can get a person, but you can also do some reading on your own. Um, WSU has a lot of really, really good resources as well. Washington State University for everybody in case you're not familiar with them. Um, David, there was a question about, does Everett allow food to be grown in the right of way? I do not know the answer to that question. No, Seattle does. Uh, no, so they, they, they don't. Um, I think almost nowhere in Snohomish County does. Um, they, um, it's, it's a complicated issue as to why. 
and it's because the way that Snohomish County works uh, without going too deep into it, you can kind of get away with it for as long as you get away with it. Um, and then when you can't get away with it anymore, um, you can't get away with it. Um, so you're welcome to do that um, and try to uh, um, figure out, you know, just sort of try, uh, uh, test your luck and ask your neighbors not to snitch on you. Um, but I, there's, there's, there's nothing that specifically uh, permits it. And remember, if you're putting uh, a garden, food garden in the right of way and it has heavy street traffic, you are getting people's tailpipe exhaust on it, just saying. Um, there was another question from Sarah. Uh, Sarah gets her mulch from a local arborist. Is that typically enough to keep your soil healthy? David's been recommending arborists. If you're just going from a tree chipping service, they may or may not know the health of the trees that they're chipping. Okay, mm -hmm. so like the PUD gets whatever they are, Davy Tree Service comes out chips a bunch of trees that are under the power line, those trees could be diseased and you have to be careful with mulch because you can spread disease with it. But as David's been kind of pushing for your local arborist, they can tell you if they're giving you mulch, most likely they're not gonna give you diseased trees in your mulch. So that's how I would say, you're probably doing a fine job as you are now. Yeah, I, it, if you are using anything like chip drop or a local arborist or something like that, Something you do need to be aware of is asking the right questions when they're getting ready to dump stuff. Um, a lot of trees that are taken out, like laurels have arsenic, um, a lot of holly trees get chipped. And if they're tossing in the branches at the same time, you may end up with holly in your yard. Um, if you are getting it from somebody that you know and that you trust, um, I think you're probably doing just fine. If you are getting it from a service um, like Chip Drop, it's still a wonderful, wonderful resource. You just need to make sure that you ask the right questions. Um, I, I, I've been accused sometimes of trying to turn people off trip drop. I'm really not. I think it's a wonderful service and I'm so happy that it exists. You just have to make sure that you ask the right questions um, so that you don't end up in a worse spot. Um, something I wanna note earlier is somebody was asking um, about uh, resources and we we're talking about WSU. Almost every county has a WSU extension in it. Um, if you are in Snohomish County, you have a you have a Snohomish County WSU extension, and you have an extension through um, Everett Community uh, College. Both of those are great resources uh, when talking about any kind of food producing stuff. Um, and I know that King County and at least most of the other counties in Western Washington also have a WSU extension. Strongly recommend working out, uh, 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 reaching out to them. And so Sarah asked about, we have so many mushrooms coming up from the wood chips we get. Is that typical? You should. Yes, Actually, exactly. that's a good sign because they're going to break them down. In fact, if you get mushrooms in your yard, it means you have a really healthy soil system. So yes. always appreciate your mushrooms. And then uh, David, uh, JJ is asking, do you have to age chicken manure? My neighbor shares when she cleans her coop. Oh, that's a, that's a long conversation that has... Um... I, I, I go ahead and contact me about that because I, I, I need to ask you some follow-up questions that probably exceed the scope of the time that we have here. Um, in short, you probably should, but it depends on a number of things. Um, and there's a, a, a great way to age it so that it is um, uh, very effective. Uh, but contact me so you and I can talk more about that. Yeah, and uh, there is a question about pine mulch. There are different types of mulch that can change the pH in your soil. So um, you do have to be a little bit careful about that. We will have a sustainable gardening section and what we'll do is make sure that they address that. If you're gonna um, grow a food garden, uh, you know, what's the best mulch for you? Um, we will not be, so it, unfortunately you just got the soil talk. Uh, so we're not gonna be talking about chicken manure in another one. I think that it may be something that we cover when we talk about edible gardens. Um, but I'm not on that talk, so I'm not certain. Um, and yes, you should wash your pets for, uh, for mushrooms um, and uh, just, just be aware and also yourself. Um, yeah. Please do not go out and pick mushrooms and say, my wonder if it's edible. There's a, there's a, I, I studied mycology in college. Um, I, I worked for the uh, mycology lab at University of Washington. And there was a phrase there is that every mushroom is edible once. Um, yes. don't, don't be, don't be one of those people. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I was in Minnesota and in biology and four people died out here from death cap mushrooms. So agreed. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Uh, can we send questions to you about worm casings to someone? Over? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I actually, uh, up until very recently, was farming worms myself. So more than happy to answer questions about that. Uh, when only putting mulch on right side, is that just for new trees or plus? Oh, uh, when when doing that. So that's that. So when you're when you're planting, you want to bare root. You want to get the plants that are growing directly into the soil because you want roots to grow into the native soil rather than like the potting soil. And there's a whole bunch of complicated reasons about root behavior as to why that works. Um, the reason that you want to add mulch when you're doing that, um, putting it in the native soil and making a big mulch ring uh, away from the tree um, is to neutrify the soil as those trees start to establish. You'll do that less and less as they grow up. Trees just in their infancy are very, very hungry. For any plants and flowers, the, the, the thing that you're trying to do at that point as you're planting and putting mulch down, pardon me, is to actually cover it so that weeds won't come up. So it does neutrify the soil, but what's more important is trying to suppress the weeds. So yes, you do wanna do it uh, for new trees and any plants and flowers, but you're doing them in very different ways, or not very different ways, but you're, you, have, you have different ends when you're trying to do that. Um, I hope that answers your question, Cindy. And then uh, Sarah had a question about a uh, tree on her property line that's going crazy. Roots are coming into garden beds and are near a sewer line. When you're dealing with neighbors, you're going to have to work collaboratively with them. Um, if it's a sewer line, you are either cutting roots forever or maybe you talk to your uh, neighbor about replacing that tree. This is a really tough thing in our area because it's so lush and everything grows so well. So people will get you know, all sorts of plants that will start growing into neighbors' yards, but this is where it becomes, you're gonna to need to talk to them and they should know that the sewer line could be affected, right? Because that's a really serious issue as you've seen from our photographs. Um, and I can tell you from having worked with homeowners, it's really, really a serious issue. Yeah. So we are obviously over time a little bit, which is okay, but I just wanted to, um, there was one question that got asked twice that I don't think was um, addressed yet. And it was from Carly and she um, said that uh, Seattle allows for food to be grown in the right of way, but she was wondering if Everett allows for that or, oh, it was already addressed. Never mind. Yeah, it, okay. it was addressed. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. I missed that one. <laughs> Carly, if you, if you are looking for some solutions with that, please go ahead and contact me. Um, one of our sections is urban agriculture and we get really creative with a lot of that stuff. We may be able to help you, um, but no, there is nothing that specifically says that food, I would love it if there was, believe me. Um, that would, if I, if I could pull off any kind of policy coup, I think that might be it. Um, but if you, if you wanna reach out to us, we can, we can help you figure something out. All right, so we should probably wrap it up. So I just want to um, say thank you to both David and Monica for their awesome information and presentation. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, and hopefully you have enough information and confidence to um, get out into your yard today before the rain starts again tomorrow, um, at least get a good start on it. So um, we will be um, having our next class on um, Saturday, January 23rd, which will be focused on landscaping with native plants with Monica and another staff member from the Snohomish Conservation District. So um, hopefully you will join us for that. And until then, have a great weekend. Thank you. Take coming, care. Everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone.